Hello, everybody. This is Vince Russo from Russo'sBrand.com, and you are in for a treat. You are in for a very special show because I'm telling you, I have Hollywood royalty on today's show. I have a man that has had over 150 roles in both television and movies. I have a man that is an Academy Award nominee. I have a man that is an author. I have a man that is an artist. I have a man that has done it all. Let me give you some of his credits because you know who he is. This man has been on Seinfeld as Tom Pepper, the the person casted for the role of Kramer. This guy's been on Friends as Mr. Heckles. Breaking Bad, that's three iconic shows as old Joe. That's just the tip of the iceberg. This man co-starred in Escape from Alcatraz with the great uh, Clint Eastwood. Charlie Butts. Planes, Trains, Automobiles. Does that ring a bell? Home Alone. Billy Madison. The list goes on and on and on. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an iconic actor here, Mr. Larry Hankin. Larry, welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you, Mr. Russo, and good night. (laughs) I can't follow that. Just... I, I I have I don't I just want to make one correction. Go it's ahead. 100, it's 182 shows. Listen, I got to tell you something, Mr. Hankin, and I feel like I should call you Mr. Hankin because you 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 are royalty. It's over the top. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Look, stop. Okay, uh, I have to follow what you're saying. So don't do that, that Larry. Let me tell you something. Cool. People. Call me a, people call me a workaholic. I'm a schlep compared to what you, you have. Gotta pay. You got to pay the rent. <laughs> I'm reading everything about you. I'm going on. You got a terrific website, which I went to. I'm reading everything. About, and I'm saying to myself, first of all, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm saying in order to have accomplished this in in, in in his career, number one, there's no way you could have ever been married. A- am I right about that? <laughs> am I right about No way you could have accomplished this and been married. You pinned me there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. That's so that's the first question. The number the second thing is I'm reading this thing and I'm like, bro, bro, when did this did this guy sleep? Did 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 you sleep during all this? Well, you know, I mean, the reality of, you know, you can go on and on because what you're doing is you're cherry picking. But the life is not cherry picking. There are long months where you don't work and you and there's, you know, auditions where you don't get the job. And you're not talking about those. You're talking about all the things I did. How about talking about all the things I didn't? Yeah, that's a lot longer list. Well, you know, Larry, I have to ask you that. I I am a writer. I am a workaholic. I am a podcaster now. But I have to ask you this. Because of the nature of your job, you are what they would call a character actor. You go from role to role to role to role. Due to the nature of your job, is that how you kind of got in a – in, in a style of life where you are constantly creating different types of content because you've got to keep moving, keep moving, keep moving, reinventing yourself, going to that next job. Is, is that how you became such a workaholic, a master of many things? You don't become a workaholic. You either are or you aren't. Uh, I just have stuff in my head that I want to manifest outside. Uh, If you don't hire me to do your movie, I'll go off and do my own movie. If you don't like what I paint and you don't, these are my paintings back there. If you don't buy my paintings, I just paint another one. I don't give a fuck what you do. (laughs) Uh, So, I mean, I'm just, I'm just driven by something that has nothing to do with me the conscious me, I just do what I do. I wake up in the morning and I do something. 
or I don't, or I go bike riding. But I don't keep a record. I don't look back. I just wake up in the morning and do what I got to do that day. And then somebody like you or a podcaster comes along and say, hey, man, you know, I was just looking at your record. You did 182 movies. That's amazing. And I go, I never knew that. Thank you for telling me that. I, in other words, it it doesn't work the way you think it works. And you're telling me I work. It doesn't work that way. You just wake up in the morning and you do something. That's all. Or you don't do something. Well, and, exactly. you know, somebody looks back and says, my God, well, if I did all the looking back, I'd never do anything. Well, you know, Larry, let me ask you this, because this was a little bit of interesting to me. And I don't want to this isn't going to be the type of interview where we're going to go down memory road and you were born a young child. We're not, we're not going to do that. And I want to concentrate on you. And here's the first thing that was very interesting to me. You you went to college for, you know, industrial design, which. Wow. Yeah, which is yeah, that's not a you know, that's not like going to a college for liberal arts. I mean, there is a lot entail with that. But yet from this, you went and you started, uh, you know, I, I think you really wanted to become a, a stand up comedian. You started working coffee houses, open mics. But you had to know that prior to college, didn't you? But yet you still went to college and got a degree in industrial engineering. When did you make that decision? I want to get into the entertainment field. I want to be a stand-up comedian. Never made that decision. That never occurred to me. Anything you just said never occurred to me. What happened was I was a good son, but I had a bad upbringing. So um, I didn't really get along with my parents. I hardly got along with my sister. Now I get along with a great, she's a great sister. She's one of the best human beings I know. But other than discovering that later in life, just personally, um, <clears throat> I was, a, I try to be a good son. I was born a good son. That's what mm -hmm. I was born. I was also born a storyteller. That didn't come till later, but I did keep my mom apprised of my day every day. I'd come home and I'd tell her everything. And she Listen, I guess I was interesting or she was just a good mother. But whatever that was, okay. But I was a good son, so I did everything correctly and I was brought up wrong. So I learned a lot of wrong things and stupid things and not to be curious and not to do anything that had to do with art. Just go to school and be a doctor or a lawyer and take care of us in our old age. That was it. That was my upbringing. Uh, and then I had a crazy father and a good mother. Thank God one of them turned out okay. So all the things that you just said never occurred to me. I never wanted to be an actor. I never wanted to be a stand-up comedian. I never wanted to be in show business. I like watching it. You know, I, I watch television a lot, but I also read a lot. I mean, and my entire getting to where I'm talking to you right now is actually a huge mistake. Or, or let's say a trial and error and random path. I never, I, I always lived in the now. I never looked ahead. I, that's not a good thing, by the way. That's a but, hard thing. That, that's, a, that's a hard thing. Yes, it is. Now, so what it does is it gives you a lot on one side and nothing on the other side, you know, so you can concentrate and, and so I can lose myself in, in the day. I'm going to do today, I'm going to do, and there's nobody else going to disturb me because I'm going to do this. It's also called, you know, instant gratification. I just want to get to the end of this. So I'm not going to go anywhere else. I'm going to just well, do it. Larry, I've, I've got to, I, if you don't mind, please, I want to examine that a little bit more because that's sure. very difficult for people because we tend to worry about tomorrow, what tomorrow brings. And people could tell, tell us, Live in the now. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. That's a lot easier said than done. So how did you – and that has a lot to do with acting too because I, I was a writer in the wrestling business, but I produced thousands of wrestlers, and I, I always had to tell them, be in the now, be in the now, put yourself in the moment, be in the now. But that's when they were acting. How do you put yourself in the now in life? That's not easy for a lot of people. Be born dyslexic with ACHD, ADHD and a little bit of, um, there's another weirdness I have. Uh, that's what did it. And dyslexia puts you in the now. The uh, 
uh, unfortunate part of dyslexia. That's the good part. It puts you in the now. The bad part is that, no, you, you understand, you don't exist in the now all the time now, even though you're in the now. You got rent next month. Right. That, you have rent next month. You're not living in the fucking now all the time. Don't give me that bullshit. So now is only now for now. There's also a later, and that's dues. So th th there is no now, now. So I, I'm a, I was dyslexic. I am dyslexic. I was born dyslexic and ADHD. So that just came to me because I, I, there's a, a, a weird wiring in my head. It has nothing to do with my willpower or my, uh, you know, aim for the future. It just, that's how it is. So I was stuck with it. But as uh, getting back to the good son, so they wanted me to go to school. So I went to school. Mm -hmm. They wanted me to do my homework. So I did my homework. And I also was very intelligent, which is a downer, man. When you're in high school, I was beat up a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so don't give me that crap about, oh, <laughs> man, he's in the now. Oh, he's very intelligent. So there's a lot of dues to be paid with right. being in the now and just like, all that bullshit. Okay. And then I went to college and I went to college because I was trying to be a good son and all my other par uh, friends and their parents sent their kids to college. And I didn't know any better because they never taught me any better. I never, mm -hmm. they never talked to me about the future. I never knew what my father, I knew what my father did because he lived in the same house with me, but I didn't know what, what that entailed. So I you never, know, had Larry, I, get on my, I get on my parents all the time. My, because uh, I'm getting the same five from you. My parents never ta taught me about the birds and the bees. I, I yeah. had to learn this. On my, did your parents sit you down to, and have this conversation with you? They never sat me down and had a conversation about anything. <laughs> Come on, man, <laughs> grow up. <laughs> yes, you know, there's other lives besides the ones you see on television. You know, selling stuff. Everybody doesn't, you know, have a perfect body. And get right. kissed and laugh every time they buy a new car. That's bullshit, man. Right. <laughs> so I grew up in the other world. And so I went to college. And because I was in college and I had dyslexia, I concentrated on my art because I like to draw. But it was art. And there was also physics and math and all that bullshit. So I got through it. I was, I was a good student, too, because I was a good son, because I wanted to be a good kid. But mm -hmm. once I graduated college, my best friend in college was Carl Gottlieb. Mm -hmm. And that changed everything. My friend, my, my good friend, Carl Gottlieb, because he said, because I was hired to go to um, uh, General Motors to uh, design uh, cars for the future. And I was paid a big salary because I, I was almost had an eight straight A average in college. Uh, but I didn't want to do that. I just was a good son. So now that's finished and the good son was over. And so um, Carl said, hey, what are you doing? And I said, well, I don't know what I do. And I'm not, I don't know what I want to do. I don't want to go to uh, Detroit. And he said, well, I'm going, he said, he's going to Greenwich Village to become a writer. Carl Gottlieb wrote Jaws eventually. Yes. So he knew what he, was, he wanted to do. I didn't. He said, why don't you come with me? We'll be roommates. And I said, okay, fine. Uh, what are you going to do? I, I don't know, but I don't want to go to Detroit. And since I never had to worry about money because I was in college, you know, they send me all an allowance, my, mm -hmm. my parents. And I had a scholarship. So um, I never had to worry about money. I never had to worry about anything. And then all of a sudden I was in Greenwich Village on my own with no preparation whatsoever. And the only thing I could do, which I liked, which because it was a job that I got, swabbing uh, duck boards in the bar after 2 a.m. Mm -hmm. uh, from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m., I swabbed and I cleaned, and I don't want to see another peanut shell as long as I live. <laughs> and and, and I, that's what I did. And I used to steal the food from the, it was a bar and grill. I used to go into the, the locker and steal rashers of bacon, which are flat. So I could put them behind my, in, in my belt, behind my back. And I always, mm -hmm. always wore a raincoat to work. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, Harpo Marx. Yes, you know, it is. <laughs> always wear a raincoat to work so I could put food in there. 
I didn't steal too many cans because they're round and small. I could go into detail about how to steal. <laughs> fruit. Uh, anyway, and I would always stand by the door. They always locked me in. I don't know why that was. I guess they didn't want people coming. I don't know. They did this. I couldn't get out. In other words, at 2 a.m. I was locked in until the chef came in at six in the morning. He let me out. And at five minutes to six, I would always finish whatever I had to do, put on my raincoat, get all my food flat, and uh, stand by right by the door. So as soon as the chef opened the door, I would get out because I didn't want to be caught with any right. kind of bumps. I would right. just stand outside, say good night, and boom, and that was it, or good morning, boom, and out. And then Carl Gottlieb, who was reviewing movies, so that's what I was doing. So I, so far, no show business, no bullshit, right. no nothing. Right. I was right. starting. Carl Gottlieb was also re was reviewing movies at the time because he knew what he wanted to do, and he was a good writer. So uh, he was writing just for locals, and, and no big, nothing big or anything famous. Just but but in those days, back in the sixties, all reviewers reviewed one movie at, at a time. So mm -hmm. in other words, if you were with the New York Times or with Carl's newspaper, which was you know five blocks distribution, mm -hmm. you all were in the same movie watching. And all the, in those days, you get um, a glass of wine or two glasses of wine and uh, some uh, frozen shrimp. You know, those bowls of uh, cold shrimp. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what you had. They had some damask napkins. No paper napkins in those days. Damask mm -hmm. napkins. And you go in, you get a little high, a little food, and you go in and you watch the movie. Mm -hmm. So what he would do, Carl would, and you had to wear a suit. This is, wow. you know, 60s. You had to wear a suit. Yeah. For a few movies. So he would get a damask napkin. He would get a handful of shrimp, put it in the damask napkin, put it in his pocket, and that was my dinner. Wow. So between the, the the bar and Carl, I was being fed for about two two months that went on. Yeah. Now, during the day, I had nothing to do, and also at night, I had nothing to do. And no money. So I would go to coffee houses at night, buy a cup of coffee, and sit there for open mic nights, which were cheaper than any other nights. Mm-hmm. And I would see, well, well, I was funny in high school. I won funny in high school two years in a row, man. I can do that. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out, no, I couldn't. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not the same. You know, you're hanging around with friends and you're making them laugh. That's one thing. But if people, even for paying, you know, a buck fifty or two fifty for a cup of coffee and they can stay there all night, it's still they want to laugh, they pay. Right, right. So, you know, so it's difficult. I still have recordings of my first tries it stand-up comedy that's it's funny but it's sad <laughs> so, i wasn't i wasn't good but i was a good learner i you know i so that was oh wait a minute i want to do this that's when i said i wanted to be a comedian never before i just said hey i was funny in high school these guys are nothing they're schleps you know i can do that now would get on stage but here's the key and this is the great thing about open mic night and open mic nights made me what I got me here to talk to you. Right. Open mic nights. The, the way it works is you get up on stage and you do three to five minutes. That's it. And if you're not funny in three to five minutes, the audience doesn't. Right. <laughs> but you're off in three to five minutes and they're nursing a coffee and they're probably there to see a friend they came to see who brought them. Because, yeah, you, you know, they want you to bring audiences. So, you know, uh, say, hey, bring your friends. So, in other words, if you're bad on open mic night, and the open mic nights were Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So I had three three days, three coffee houses, or no, five coffee houses, and I could just, you go in and early, do one show, do the entire rounds, come back, and then do the late show. Wow. Three to five minutes. So yeah. you're doing like 10 shows a night. Wow. Or or, or probably between five and 10. You go, I just do the rounds and then for three nights. Okay. And in those three nights, I started to get better. So within six months, uh, I had a manager and I was opening for Woody Allen. So that's wow. pretty cool. That's unbelievable. Yeah, it is unbelievable. But it still, it didn't register with me. I didn't know that. Oh, that's pretty cool. I thought, well, it took me six months I wanted to be up there in three days, you know, wow. opening for the big acts. So that's how I became a comedian. So there's no planning. I was just, you know, Carl and then bar and then starving and then hanging in 
coffee houses. So I could do that. And then boom, Woody Allen. Unbelievable. Stand up comedian. Larry, I'm also here, and this is where you're going to, I know you're going to have me sitting at the edge of my seat because I am a you. I was born in 1961, but my era of music is really the 60s. I cherish Janis Joplin, the psychic yeah. era. Now, from what I understand, you open for a lot of legendary music groups and may oh, have yeah. Now with, yeah can you you, you got to tell me some of those stories because oh, I, I opened for Janis Janis I opened for Janis Joplin and her boogie band you know, oh. before she had before before she got you know <laughs> into the big money and got rid of the band uh, yeah I mean we all hung out together it was San Francisco oh, oh well that, that's how I in other words. But see, opening for opening mic night and then opening for Woody, Woody has his own audience. He has his, his audience. They weren't my audience. I was making them laugh. I, I thought Woody was funny, but he wasn't He wasn't my type of humor, but there wasn't any my type of humor. And then all of a sudden, Lenny Bruce came along, and that made me laugh, man. And so I got into critical thinking humor, which is, that's a no-no. Because then, all of a sudden, jaunty, jolly, opening mic nights, funny guy, hey, <laughs> funny yeah. guy, and now cops are pulling me off. The yeah. I'm, being, I'm being busted for talking. <laughs> yeah. So all that Woody Allen stuff just started to go down the toilet. I mean, I was opening for, like, Miles Davis, the Kingston yeah. Trio. But, you know, you, when I was opening for the Kingston Trio, I was opening for Miles Davis, I would say, kill. You know, <laughs> I would, uh, it was great. They, they were they were my crowd, man. I could talk about anything, you know, drugs, sex, and rock and roll. But when I started to open for the Kingston Trio, guys came at me in nightclubs, but guys came at me with upside down beer bottles in their fists, saying, "Get the fuck off the stage! And bring on the Kingston Trio!" <laughs> yeah. You know, so yeah. that's jarring for somebody who wanted to be a good kid and and a good son. Yeah. It was jarring because as cops would take me off the stage, I was opening for the Love and Spoonful, for the Blues Project, for Ian and Sylvia. Jeez. So those were okay. But when I opened for the uh, Love and Spoonful in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, no, in, in Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, um, cops, 20, 20 cops pulled me off the stage, came down in a phalanx. They were booing me. I'm, I'm yelling <laughs> back at them. <laughs> drugs, rock and roll. You're a college student. What the hell are you doing? Get off the stage with all the God. No God. <laughs> they were pulling their uh, their uh, um, armrests. You know the wooden armrests, and these. Yeah. Are they were yeah. pulling them off and throwing them at me. <laughs> and then when they, you know, and then the fifth row couldn't throw them. It's too far already. They're heavy. Those things were heavy. <laughs> <laughs> so they were throwing the first three rows, were throwing these things at me. No girls. No <laughs> girls do anything, only guys. And then they put the lights on, and I said, okay, I'll calm down, I'll calm down. Uh, I'm not going to do anything dirty, no dirty material. I'll do the clean stuff. So I had about 10 more minutes of clean stuff, and they calmed down. They listened to me. They said, I'm going to do only clean stuff. So I did 10 minutes of clean stuff, and then when I got a really big laugh, I said, okay, back to God now. All right, and then it erupted. Boo, get out of here. And the guys in the back, all the way in the back, because I could see them. They had the arena lights on. They started pulling their oh. arms <laughs> them down to the guys. Oh, the my God. So you're gonna get, now you're going to get somebody so, killed. Now. So I called my manager, and I said, look, man, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not even doing drugs yet. Right. That was the truth. I said, I'm not doing drugs yet. Lenny at least was doing drugs. I could, you know, excuse, okay, he's doing drugs. I got to arrest him. I'm not. So he said, well, why don't you join Second City? They're doing the same thing as Lenny and George and Richie Pryor, and George Carlin. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you can do the same thing, but they own the theater and they'll throw the guy with the beer bottle out, you know. So yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that's what I did. I auditioned. I auditioned actually with uh, Robin Williams. Uh, wow. No, no, no reason. It was just coincidence. He just yeah. happened to be there, and I happened to be there. 
I mean, and he wasn't Robin Williams yet, he, but he had the white uh, bib overalls and the rainbow. Thing. Yeah, I mean, he could, he's recognizable. I saw him from television. So, yeah, we auditioned. He went to one company. I went to the other. But that was like, I love that. That was the best, improvising. Yeah. Now, I, I know from me, I want to ask you one question, though, about a certain individual, because I'm not sure exactly when you started work with him. But from Second City, then you kind of started your own troupe called the Committee, correct? That that came after Second City. Was yeah. that correct? Well, yeah, a couple of those are my own committee. So I, I'm, somebody else, uh, Alan Meyerson and Jessica Meyerson, his wife, okay. started, but they were working for Second City. And they came to me and they said, hey, you know, we're picking out five or six people, go to San Francisco and open up a second city there, only we'll call it the committee, nothing to do with second city. So I said, yeah, fine. Um, I'm happy here. I wasn't working too much in, in yeah. second city in Chicago because the, they had a full cast. You know, I, I was, you know, last in, me and Jack Burns, who – actually invented hee haw he wrote he he wow okay so yeah. we were in the same company so we were both fired we were let go we weren't fired it was just too many it was nine people yeah an improv company is way too much you can only get five because you, you you're nine people you're only maybe improvising once a night that that's not enough yeah they let us go we were hanging around for a while i was couch surfing with Roger Bowen on Roger Bowen's couch. Uh, he was an actor. And uh, and then uh, a car came through Chicago one night in the snow and rain. And they said, hey, we're going to San Francisco to start a new company, hop in. And I said, no, because I didn't trust, I had uh, show business, I don't trust anybody. Right, and right. So I said, no, send me a plane ticket and I'll fly there. I don't know where you guys are going. I was right. like, Packed car. It was a station wagon with seven adults, two kids, and a pile of luggage on the top. I mean, I'm not getting in that car. Right. <laughs> That's a kidnap situation. <laughs> right. I, I thought, and sure enough, they sent me a plane ticket about two weeks later, and I flew out, and I, I was there. So now I'm on the West Coast. Now I'm improvising, but that's acting. No, it's not. But, you know, uh, I'm improvising. We were very successful. And the kicker was that uh, PSA flights, airlines, you could fly round trip from L.A. to San Francisco for $35 in the wow. 60s. Wow. Yeah, so these heavy hitters, you know, these, uh, these green light people, these managers would fly up for the day, you know, see the first show, fly back at night or fly back the next morning, you know, 35 bucks, you know, a hotel, blah, blah, blah. It's great. They bring their girlfriend, their wife, whatever. So we were being seen wow. by the heaviest people in LA who we could not get in to see if we flew down there and tried wow. to get in. They were coming to see you. Amazing. They were coming to see us in a hit show. Yeah, so we're all gold, man. I mean, we're all constantly flying down for doing a, like a one day or a five day. And in improv, you can do that because it's improv. So if you're if me and you are doing a scene and I get and you get called down to L.A. to do a job for a week. Either I could do your part and somebody does mine or somebody does your part and I'll do it with them. And we'll improvise a new scene or they'll do it sort of what you did and sort of what I did yeah. within the context of the narrative that's supposed to be laid out. That yeah. was the only thing we had. Narrative. And, and so and that's how I became an actor. So you see my, my protest, protestations in the beginning of what you're talking about have nothing to do with my life. You were living in the now, and this, this I was this, living in the now, but also I was also broke because as soon as I in the now, because right. I as soon as I got money, I thought, well, it's now, I'm fine, uh, so I'll I'll spend it on either my art or making films. Yeah. So I was always broke, always broke. Now, but now is voluntary. But I was still in the now. Yeah. Just enough to pay the rent and maybe get some food. Yeah. Now, Larry, before we go on to the next chapter, I have to ask you this question because, you know, you, I've, you know you've worked with the greats, but you worked with one guy that I, man, I think one of the most underrated 
comedians of all time. I loved everything uh -huh. he did. He passed away recently. Um, Fred Willard. Oh, Fred! Yeah, please, he was my hero. Yeah, how did how did you how did you come Back together? In the we we got together. He was wow. the first man. He was the first guy. I when I moved to Greenwich Village with Carl Gottlieb. Right. We lived in the village on the sick on. The, oh my God! I forgot the name of the street. Uh, I don't know. Anyway. It was it was where all the coffee houses shut. And as I walked the first night, where I, I I wanted to go see what the village was like, I was going to explore. I had moved in. Carl was reviewing a movie. I had the evening, and as I walked out of the house, I walked across Sixth Avenue, and the first coffee house I saw because it had flags and stuff outside. I mean it. And, and and floodlights looking at the flags and it said Cafe Bazaar. I'll never forget this because he's my hero. Mm, I love him. The flags outside Cafe Bazaar. So I walked in. I just walked in and there was two guys on the stage. Two comedians, well, two funny guys duo. Uh, Willard and something in Willard and I don't remember the other guy's name and I'm sorry I did because they were incredibly funny. And Fred was just amazing. And I just sat there and I go, and I said, I, I, I want to do that. Mm -hmm. I, it was Fred Willard that, wow, and that was first the first coffee house. And Fred Willard, he was up there and he was so funny and so serious. He's, he's so into what he does. Yeah. There's yeah. no, you can't find Fred once he goes into his. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Fred, where did you go? But he was so funny, and I. So how how was how was now that you said that what what type of a man was he on a personal level? He's very quiet, very shy. I never got to talk to him, ever. Yeah. Even even when I went to his parties, you know, his wife and and him when he was famous, you know, before he died, years years before he died, when I was an actor in Hollywood, uh, you know, all the, all the funny people knew one another, and I was yeah. funny by then officially. And uh, so I was invited, you know, and we crossed paths. You know, it was always high, and he knew my work, and I knew his work, and he's high yeah. life. But, you know, even when I remember one particular party, I was determined to talk to Fred. So I <laughs> stayed afterwards. Well, you know, not well, when the party was breaking up, and then you just right. everybody goes into the living room and just sit right. around with the people left. And, you know, I sat next to him, and, you know, but we were talking to other people and blah, blah, blah. But that's... That's the kind of guy he he was, and then one day I, I so revered him. I, I never told him that, but I mean that that's how I felt because he was a master at what he did. I mean, there's no he was yeah. a master, and and you got to follow those people, right? Uh, <laughs> you just have to. Uh, one day I made a movie which actually uh, it didn't get an Academy Award, but it got a lot of awards. It was called The Outlaw Emmett Demas. And I, I brought it over to his house uh, uh, because uh, there was a, some party, uh, just a very small group of people, and I was invited. So I brought the film. I thought I would, oh, I'd show Fred. I wanted to show Fred. Right, right. <laughs> and so there was just him and his wife and his kids and me and uh, a couple of, just one or two other people. That was it. I mean, it was the end of the evening. And uh, he thought it was okay. <laughs> he didn't <laughs> rave about it. And it was, oh, God, I was so depressed for days. Yeah, but, yeah. I mean, it got a lot of awards. It went all around the world. So it was a pretty good film. It was very funny. Yeah. But yeah. I wanted only Fred to That's like That's great. That is great. Yeah. Now, now, Larry, let me ask you this. I know, I, I believe I know, but I think I, I, two things I want to touch on to segue into acting. I think your first role was Viva Max in the movie. 19 oh, my God. Yeah. I, I don't know who was first, but yeah. Yeah, but then I'm reading about your actual first acting role. I want to confirm this. Penny Williams had seen you doing your act and gave you a spot on Laverne and Shirley. Is this true? Penny Marshall. Penny, I'm sorry, Penny Marshall. Is Was that your first gig? Yeah. Wow. So yeah, she. Yeah. Penny Marshall discovered me. Right. Amazing. I discovered Fred Willard. I mean, in my own personal way. <laughs> right, right, right. But, but Penny Marshall discovered me. 
actually, in, in reality, she came up, she flew up round trip, saw the show, and two days later, I got a call from her, from Laverne and Shirley production office saying, and they said that. They said, uh, um, Penny Marshall f flew up. She said that. Uh, they said that. It was a woman who called, called me. Penny Marshall flew up there and said the tall guy, Larry Hankin, uh, she was doing a dancing thing where uh, Laverne and Shirley were going to their prom and she needed a date for the prom and she wanted to dance with the physical comedian, Larry Hankin. In wow. And so they, they flew me down. And then, so I did the show and then uh, about four days later, I get a call from the production company again. Uh, no, I got a call from a, an agent. They didn't have an agent up there. I didn't need one, you know. Right, right. Uh, I, I, I didn't want to go to L.A. I didn't want to be an actor. I, I thought that was all face acting. Right. All close-ups. No, you want to see the whole actor up on the stage. Right, yeah. With other people being funny. So I didn't want to go down there. I was face acting. So the, she, so I got a call from an, an agent. And he said, you know, hi, are you Larry Hagan? Yeah, at, at my home. And I said, yeah, what do you want? He goes, uh, do you have an agent, agent, a manager, or anything? No. Well, would you like one? Uh, I don't know. Oh, be, because I said, well, how do you even know I exist? I'm here in San Francisco. He said, well, I went, uh, and he actually told me this. He said, me and my partner, um, every uh, two weeks, we go to all the TV production offices. Personally, we just we don't make a phone call. We go and uh, we ask any new actors coming through that you hired as extras or as, you know, one offs or something like that, that were interesting to you that don't have any uh, representation. And they said, yeah, the guy named Larry Hankin was here, a tall guy. Penny Marshall seemed to be, uh, you know, up on him. So, uh, yeah, that's who we have. Yeah. So you give me your number. Give me his. Yeah, give me his number. Could you, you know? And they gave me. And he called me and he, he said, "Well, why don't you come down the next time you're here? Uh, come down and uh, let's talk." And so I got a call from to do another TV show or something. I don't know why, but I was down there maybe to visit somebody. And so I went in and he said, "Okay, you want? How about us?" I go, "Fine." And that was that was it. You know. now, now, Larry, how was the transition for you? Because improv and being in front of a crowd and playing off of that crowd, that's what stand-up is, that's what improv is. Making the transition now to memorize script, direct lights, camera, action, was, was, that, was that an easy transition for you? Because it's two completely different forms. Yeah. Um, trying to think of where the problem was solved. Yes, I was over the top in the beginning, but I was in San Francisco and I was in a hit show called The Committee. Right. And there were movie makers up there. I mean, we weren't famous until the second second or third year. You know, it was a struggle. You know, you slowly get more and more. And then all of a sudden you hit and then that's it. We were as big as second city and committee by the third year. But the first year we starved, it was like, you know, don't quit your day gig. If there was right. more people on stage than in the audience, we didn't have to do a show. I mean, so that's a year of just putting in the time. Uh, so, um, no, wait a minute. I lost track of what I was answering. I'm sorry. You were answering the transition because it's the a transition. So, Form. Uh, when I did get an, a manager and uh, an agent, and they were sending me now, you know, hey, you got to, you got to get down here. But I was over the top, and I didn't get a lot of jobs in the beginning. It's just like stand up, you know. You get some learning right. to right. me, right? To me, a lot of people just grok it instantly. I mean, like Bob Dylan gets it the first time. Wow. You try to teach Bob Dylan something, he'll get it the first time. It's okay. Yeah, right. Like this. Yeah. Not me. <laughs> right, you right. Keep, you know what? Uh, I don't get, you know, the dyslexia. It, it, uh, linear thinking is not my shtick, man. Right, right, <laughs> right, right, right. right. <laughs> so, uh, 
But I finally got that. We got about as over the top. So I started watching, and that's what got me into. Well, I'm a learner, so you know, you just if you you can't get it, you just figure it out. That's yeah, the well, like, I, I, get, I get the feeling like a lot of people would have, you know, stars in their eyes and they would know the steps they're going to take. And I'm going to start here and then I'm going to get an agent and then I'm going to go there. It seems to me like you in this instance and, you know, who you are, it seems to me like you just wanted to kind of ace everything that you did. So once you got into the acting in this different format, it just seemed like you wanted to be the best at that. Just like when you were doing improv, I would think. Well, you could look at it that way because that's what it seems like. But from the inside out, that's not what was going on. What was going on was I needed a job and I had to pay the rent. That was the only thing that worried me was rent. Right. Right. I didn't care about food or medical attention. It was just somehow a roof over my head. Yeah. And I lived homeless, so it it really I understand what that means what I'm saying to you. Uh, and so the the rent was very important. So I just wanted to pay the rent. Now I'm a slow learner because of dyslexia and ADHD. Uh, so what you don't put into your figuring is the pain of failing. Mm. because I fail a lot. And now that's part of my learning process. Now, if you talk to champs, champions, champion boxers, champion wrestlers, champion baseball players and football players, they tell you that you can't be a winner if you can't fail. Right. You don't have to fail, you can't win. Right. It, it's just... So I learned to fail. I learned to not let it bother me because that's, and here's the thing that got me through. Somebody told me this and they said, oh, okay, I'm cool. I said, when you get a no, like a boo, a boo, or a no, you can't have the part, you're not good enough. He said, see, I think it's maybe Tony Robbins, actually, because uh, <laughs> he said, um, Remember what you're looking for. I'm looking for a job. I'm looking for a job. Mm -hmm. If they say no, that's not what you're looking for. You're not looking for a no. Mm -hmm. You're looking for a job. So I would keep trying because I, I, I wasn't getting what I was looking for. I'm not looking for a no. I'm not looking for a rejection. It's not that I was rejected. It has nothing to do with me. I'm not looking for a rejection. I'm looking right, for a right. job. Right, right, right. Keep your focus, man. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so once I got that, once I got a job, I go into good son mode. You're here. Get this down, man. Yeah, yeah. Down. So I'm not, I'm not trying to be the best. That, that's Tiger Woods. Tiger yeah. Woods wants to be the best at what he's at. No, no. I just want to get better. I can do it better. That's my mantra. Yeah. I'm not here for rejection. I want to do it better. Yeah. Also, no, so no. you think that, that, that I'm, I'm the best. Well, that's in your head. Well, it's not in my head. You're, you're, you were hired 180 times. How's that in my head? That's factual. You are, <laughs> you've been on everything. But you're, but you're not putting into consideration – how I got there, how I got there in your mind is how you think you would get there, would like to get there, That's or how true. you think I would get there. I didn't get there your way. Yeah. I get there, I got there my way, and everybody gets there their way. Their way. Yep, you're but right. The main thing, I think maybe one of these, uh, I'm trying to think of what I'm going to put on my headstone. Right, right. And I, I've got a couple, but one that's right up there on the short list is figure it out. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And that's what you did. Yeah. I mean, yeah, but th that's all I can do. I mean, I yeah. can't do it any other way. They only yeah. get the first time. I don't. Yeah. Now, Larry, let me, let me, let me ask you. I don't. Yeah. yeah. Now, Larry, is your, you got an agent now. You're getting booked. Uh, you know, obviously you have talent. You're learning the craft. You're good at what you do. Was there a first like holy shit role that like you could imagine? Because like when I'm looking at this and, and you know watching clips of you acting next to 
Clint Eastwood. To me, to me, that's holy shit. What was the first role you got that was really like a holy shit moment for you? Escape from Alcatraz. Wow, that's incredible. Man. What what what's 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 that even like getting that gig and uh, arriving on the well, set? Thank thank God there are certain things that come into play normally and naturally that you have nothing to do with, which kind of keeps you grounded. Uh, that it, I was okay. First of all, I get a call from my agent, and he says, "What are you doing right now?" Okay, I don't like those kind of phone calls. Right. Because whatever I'm doing right now, I, I like doing it. That's why I'm doing it now. Right. <laughs> that means you have to stop this and go and do something else. Right. And no, that's so already. What are you doing now? Uh, something I really like. Why? Right, right. right. And he goes, uh, because you have to get down to Warner Brothers right away or – it was one. I think it was one of them. I don't know what. In the valley, forty-five minutes away by car. Uh, you got to get down to bed. Clint Eastwood is making a ten-pole movie. You got to get down there right away. They need you to audition. They're stopping the audition at three o'clock. I think it was like one o'clock. So get down there before they close. So that means two things. One, I have to stop what I was doing, which I was doing nothing. I was just hanging, which I kind of like to do. Right. Right. <laughs> no wrong with that. Um, so. I get down the car now, I'm, you know, what is it called? Lead footing it, you know, <laughs> right, right. Down there. That'll and do it. it's right. a 45 minutes and I'm uh, getting more and more angry as I'm getting to be, you know, says, why? Because here's the reason for that call. You know, what are you doing now? The reason is from the agent's point of view, somebody just got fired. They got to replace somebody immediately because it's a shooting schedule. Yeah. Yeah. And, you got to get down there because not for the hiring to get you on set, to get you in the costume, to keep going. Right. That's why you have to get down there. So I'm thinking, Oh, they want me to replace somebody. Oh, I'm not good enough to get it. The first shot. No, right. they want me to replace it. Why didn't they replace me? Why didn't they hire me instead? of? Right. Right. Do that? So right. by the time I got down there, I'm like totally angered. Right. <laughs> I got down there and there's nobody else there. And obviously I'm being there to replace somebody because generally there's, you know, like four or five people who are auditioning also. So that, that really pushed me into a very depressed, angry mood. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting there and there's no signs. There was only a, 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 a secretary who uh, was there in this empty room that I had to go, yeah, go to, you know, room 507. It's a, it's a big waiting room and there's a secretary there and uh, I go uh, why are you here she says I just sat down and I waited and she says well pardon me why are you here I'm auditioning for uh, Escape from Alcatraz I don't know they said to come right away I'm, I'm the only person here oh okay and then she goes back I'm sitting there and then finally she says do you know what part you have no do you have any sides no do you, no script no he said there would be a script here. She said, well, I have a script, but I don't know what part. She gives me the entire script, 90 pages. So that's no help. You know, I don't know what to look up. I can't read right. the entire script. I just put it in my lap, and I'm just sitting there. And as soon as I put it in my lap and sat down, the door opens, and Miriam Doty, I'll never forget that name. She was a big, she was, well, it's Clint Eastwood movie, man. She's a big time yeah. agent. Yeah. So she says, uh, Larry Hankin? I go, yeah. Are you ready? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I wanted to get it over with. Right, right. <laughs> Come on, man. They tell me, you know, you're, the script will be there. They'll tell you the whole thing. Are you ready? I go, yeah. I just <laughs> want to get out of here. <laughs> I'm going to this room, and there's, it's a, it's a, I don't know what kind of room this is. I've never been in this kind of room before. It's just a black room. It's a room with no windows. I don't remember. Maybe there was one window, but it was dark. There was a light, uh, you know, a, a, a room light, but but the walls were black. In my memory, they were black. And there was three chairs facing one another, like a, just a little. Doo, doo. And and she sits down and there's uh, Don Siegel. And I didn't know who he was. It turns out he's a great, famous director. But I didn't know that at the time. Right. Amazing director. 
He's up there like with John Houston to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he is an old gentleman sitting there. There's Miriam Doty, Mariam Doty, and me. And I sit down. And, and then they start having a conversation. And this kills me because it happens all the time. Like I'm not there. Well, what do you think he could do? What 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 part do you think is it? Well, we only have two parts left, so um, I don't know. Well, what do you think we should do? Well, let's try him with the warden. What do you think about no, not the warden? Uh, about about the guard. What about the guard? And I'm sitting there like, <laughs> and I still don't have. You know, I got the script in my. And she's saying, "He says, uh, all right. Well, what about the warden?" And then he looks at me and he goes, "Well, yeah." And he then he turns to, oh yeah, no, she's. What, and he looks at me and he goes, uh, what about the warden? And, and just like I'm about to go, I, I don't know what the part is. I, I don't know. And he goes, well, and he looks at her. He says, I don't think he can do the warden. Uh, can you do the warden? Uh, the warden, I mean, it's not the warden. I keep it, it's the guard. Right. Uh, the, can you do the guard? And I go, I, I don't know what the guard is. He says, well, the guard has to... Uh, beat up Clint Eastwood. I don't think you can beat up Clint Eastwood. You think you can beat up Clint Eastwood? <laughs> no, I don't think I can beat him. He says, yeah, he, he can't beat up Clint Eastwood. So what's left? Uh, she says, well, Charlie Butts. All right. You want to do Charlie Butts? I don't know what Charlie Butts is. I don't know. I don't have the part. He says, okay, okay, okay. Uh, I'll read it with you. Uh, you know what? Uh, so you got the script there, right? Yeah. So he says, give me uh, no, he had his own script. He says, all right, I'll read it with you. And you go, no, 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 no. All right, turn to page 91. So I go, all right, turn to page. And now he's, okay, wait a minute. Do you want time? Go out, look at it, come back. I go, no, let's just do it, man. <laughs> I mean, I, that's my attitude. I mean, I, yeah. I just, yeah. this was not how I auditioned. I, I don't know what's going on. So, no, let's just do it. Okay, fine. And then she says, stop. And she's got a script. And she says, no, no, wait, wait. He can't do it. And he goes, no. What? And he goes, and she shows him on the page. She has a page. And she says, Charlie Butts is short. He has red hair, freckles, wow. and he wears glasses. And he looks at his script. And he looks at her script. And he looks at me. <laughs> he looks at her. And he goes, yeah, but the audience doesn't have the screenplay. Ah, there you go. So he says, let's just read. So I go, blah, 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 blah. He just, just shut her up. That was kind of cool. Just boom. And then she goes, I go, blah, 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 blah. He goes, okay, you got the part. Oh, my gosh, man. And I just sat there. He goes, what's the matter? I said, Nothing really. He says, "You don't believe I. You don't believe me, do you? <laughs> you don't believe me, do you? Go, no, because here's the thing. I mean, I don't know if you ever. Oh, this, they never. Uh, you know, in all my years, never get it there. They never tell you there. Even if you, even if they're mad about you, yeah, they never tell you because it's a uh, a, mon a money thing. Yeah, they really want me. All right, let's jack up the price so they don't. You know, they don't tell you. So I said, no, I don't believe you. And he says, all right, I'll tell you what. Why don't you go home and sit by the phone and see what happens? And that that's it? He goes, yeah. I said, okay, bye. He says, bye. And I just walked out. When I got, by the time I got home, about five minutes later, the, the phone rang. Hey, man, you got the part. Okay, now to answer your question specifically, about what about it was that, you know, what blew your mind? So far, my mind hasn't been blown. You asked right. me what, what blew my mind. Right. Okay. I get there. There's a whole story about I was there for three months. Uh, the awe, the part of your question was, you know, how did you work with Clint Eastwood? And also, by the way, Don Siegel. Clint Eastwood. Well, yeah, the awe was amazing. You know, I just wanted to audition. That was good enough. I could tell right. people I auditioned for it. Right. But to get the part and then to go down there and spend three months with them. Well, as I said, there's a, something natural that happens that has nothing to do with me. But thank God it happens. You can you cannot maintain an emotion 
for an infinite amount of time. I don't care if it's anger, love, or awe. You know, love turns into something more and more co co comedy. It's, I don't know, there's, there's more to it. Right, just, right, right, I mean, right. So, and that's a good thing, and you have no control over it. It just, that's a thing. Okay, anger, the same thing. You can be angry for so long, and then right. you can't, it's just too much problem. Okay, my awe, thank God. Um, just wore away. I was there for three months. Yeah. And after a while, they were just two other guys making a movie. Wow. And that relaxed me so much that my acting was so relaxed. When I watched that movie, I've watched it only twice, when I saw it the first time and years later. And I go, wow, man, I am so there. Yeah. I am so now. That's yeah. that's being now, not, not yeah. dyslexia now. Yeah, that's being he be here now. Uh, okay, so what blew my mind? Yeah, when I saw the movie, I had no idea. I don't. I don't know. I knew I got a lot of money. I did. I get. I got a, more money than I'd ever gotten in my entire life. But that was all I knew. I would get this check every week. When I saw the movie in a movie house, uh, no. When I saw the cast and crew movie, okay. That's the answer to your question. When I saw the cast and crew movie, that blew my mind. Why? Because I got co-star Billy. Jeez, wow. Not in my not in my my wildest dreams. Not even the money blew my mind as much as wow. I, I was just a, another cast member. I was like one step above the extras, the two hundred extras who played the prisoners yeah. so i didn't know that and my agent didn't tell me that nobody told me that so i'm saying that that blew it wow so that's, the, that's the end the long answer to yeah. your short question larry listen we we I'm, I'm 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 in a i'm in a pickle i got a dilemma right now because i knew this was going to happen because i knew there were a million things i wanted to ask you i knew i could sit here and listen to you talk i'll come back another time that's what I wanted to say. I want to be respectful of your time, but Larry, I, I we 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 covered nothing. We covered nothing. We got a million. Larry, please. I hope I stories, man. I didn't tell my stories. I yeah, hope I was good enough. I hope I was good enough for you to come back, man, because yeah, I, I I just I want to continue this conversation with you, man. Uh, okay, fine. I'm a I'm a storyteller. I told oh, you. My I'm God. This, storyteller. I'm this was <laughs> Well, Larry, I want to tell everybody uh, because I know I saw th th we didn't even touch upon author. Bro, Larry's artwork is phenomenal. Yeah. You can go to your website, right? Go to go yeah. to LarryHankin.com. Incredible. Yeah. And you can buy it directly from the website, right, Larry? Directly from the yeah, website. Yeah, or T-shirts or whatever. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change the prices. I'm going to have a sale I'm gonna, I, because, the, you know, I just want to get them out. I, I don't want them. You know, just stacking up. I want to get them out. Yeah, Larry, I could tell you this though; they were very uh, inexpensive to begin with. Though I don't know how much you on a low though. I looked at uh, some. Of them. I just want them on walls. See, yeah. I love them on walls. I have them on T-shirts. I also have my yeah. movie there, my little film, funny film shorts. Yeah, and yeah. I got, yeah, I got you. We didn't even talk. You were nominated for that short film, Sully's Dino. We didn't even talk. We okay, didn't. Here you go. Ready? Are you ready? Yeah. That's it. That's the the nomination. Nominated for Academy Award. There you go. That is awesome. All right, Larry. Listen, I wanted to, I want to send everybody to LarryHankin.com. Bro, his artwork is no, phenomenal. no, the real LarryHankin.com. Oh, I'm sorry, I changed it. Somebody stole it. Let me double. Somebody stole. You, you yeah, are right. real LarryHankin.com. The real somebody stole it. Yeah, they won't give it to me. They they want to charge oh. me money to get oh, the name. Please. The real LarryHankin.com. The real Larry Hankin.com. Okay. Guys, go to Larry Hank, the real Larry Hankin.com. Look at the artwork. He says he's going to put it on sale. I would grab it, bro. It's phenomenal. Larry, this was such an honor and a treat. And I hope I, I hope we can come back for a part two. We 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 scratched the no surface. Sweat. No sweat, man. No sweat. By the way, I gotta give you props for your your uh your your den. Oh, yeah, this is my little I, I saw the entire thing. You know, there's a I saw the 
big widescreen version of, of it. Yeah, it's a great it's a great place. Yeah, it's a great place to hang out. You know. Yeah, I appreciate it. Well, Larry, listen, it's been an honor. It's been a pleasure. Everybody, check out the real LarryHankin.com. You you can re- I mean, we we literally maybe hit ten percent. You can read everything about Larry. I hope Larry comes back in the future. We we didn't even talk. I didn't even talk about Seinfeld. Somebody they, they wanted oh, yeah. me to ask you if you took the raisins. Did you take the raisins? Well, um, you know, if I told you, I would have to kill everybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, we didn't even get to talk about that, but we will. Larry, thank you so okay. much. For such Anytime, an honor. just invite me back. Okay, you got my email. Now, I, got got this, I got this. I got this on video. Anytime. Yeah. All right, Larry, thank you. God bless thank the great Larry Hankin, everybody. Bye, Vinny.